Hey everyone and welcome back. So, well-being at work right. It's a hot topic, but are those programs actually making a difference? I know we've got tons of research on this, so let's jump in and try to figure out what's really going on. Yeah. I was going through this Harvard Business Review article, and one thing really stood out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it said spending on well-being programs globally is going to hit like $100 billion, but mental health issues are actually rising. It's like, what? Yeah, it does feel like something's a bit off, doesn't it? Totally. This HBR article um, makes a pretty strong argument that a lot of these programs miss the mark because they're focused on the individual, like all about, you know, meditation apps or quick therapy sessions, trying to change how employees react, but not really looking at the work environment itself. Like, right. is that actually the root cause of the stress, you know? Yeah, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg. You got to fix the actual problem. Exactly. It's a Band-Aid approach. And the article actually calls this care washing. And they say it can actually do more harm than good. Care washing. <laughs> oh, okay. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah. So think of it this way. Have you ever felt like your company was kind of just going through the motions with well-being? No. Like they're offering yoga, but then expect you to be answering emails all weekend. Yeah. That's care washing in action. It's all about appearances without addressing the real underlying issues. They give this uh, this really interesting example in the article. Imagine someone you know who's super stressed out at work and their company offers them a mindfulness app, but they're still drowning in deadlines. They try the app, maybe even talk to a therapist, but nothing really changes right? because the root cause that crazy workload is still there. Yeah, they probably just end up feeling more frustrated, right? That the company doesn't actually care. Exactly. You know? Yeah. It's like they're being told to just deal with it on their own. It makes sense why people are so disillusioned with these programs. Huh. But the good thing is the HBR article doesn't just point fingers. It also digs into why this individual-focused approach is failing. Yeah. And the first reason kind of goes back to what we've been saying. It just doesn't address those deeper systemic issues mm -hmm. that are often at the heart of employee burnout. Yeah. And the second reason is it can just feel really hypocritical to employees. You know, yeah. they're being told to prioritize self-care, but they're also dealing with unrealistic demands and maybe even a toxic work culture. So it's no wonder they feel resentful and disengaged. Right. It's like one of those things where it's like, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a study mentioned in the article uh, about doctoral students who were given advice to prioritize self-care. Oh, wow. Even though they have these insanely demanding workloads, mm. and they didn't buy it at all. They found the advice hypocritical. Wow, yeah. It just shows a real disconnect between what companies say they care about and what they actually do. Huge disconnect. And that leads us to the third reason these programs often fail abysmal engagement rates. Remember that statistic about employee assistance programs, mm -hmm. EAPs? Yeah. Well, the article says they've only seen about 5 to 10% engagement since the 1980s. Wow. So not much has changed. Not much has changed. It's a sign that something's not working, and it's not just about access to resources. The article makes a really good point. Even when employees do try those individual solutions, there's very limited evidence that they're actually effective. Right. And there's this Oxford study mentioned mm. that looked at workers who did interventions like resilience training, mindfulness. Okay. Those popular well-being apps. Yeah. And guess what? <laughs> the study found no significant improvement in well-being. Oh, wow. So for anyone who thought those apps were a cure-all. Yeah, right. It really challenges that idea. It does. That we can just fix employees without addressing the environment they're in. Exactly. And that takes us to the fifth point that the article makes. It's the lack of genuine buy-in from employers. It's not enough to just offer these programs right. Right. Leaders need to actually promote them, track their impact. <laughs> With that commitment from the top, no wonder these programs are falling flat. It's like trying to solve a puzzle with only half the pieces. You need the full picture, the systemic approach to create real and lasting change. Totally. Okay, so we've talked about how just focusing on fixing the individual doesn't really work. Yeah. We need a more like bigger picture approach, right? Yeah. One that tackles the actual system within workplaces that are causing the stress and burnout in the first place. Yeah. But what does that even look like? I bet our listeners thinking, okay, cool, this all sounds great, but how do I actually change the system? Right, well, the article talks about this shift. From an I-frame, that's that individual focus, to an S-frame, which means looking at the entire system. So instead of asking, what's wrong with you, 
it's what's wrong with this environment. Right. And you've probably experienced this yourself. Like when the company focuses on giving you a meditation app, yeah. instead of addressing those insane deadlines, oh, yeah. it's like they're missing the point. You know, that's the S frame. They need to fix the system, not just expect you to adapt. Right. That makes total sense. And this whole idea of an S frame isn't just some new trendy concept. The article points out that it aligns with recommendations from like big organizations like the World Health Organization oh. and the ISO 4503, which is the global standard for psychological health and safety at work. Yeah. So it seems like there's a real shift happening here in how we think about well-being in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. And the cool thing is the research is catching up with this new way of thinking. The article highlights some really great examples of companies that are taking a more systemic approach. And they're seeing some awesome results. One that I thought was super interesting was the four-day work week. Oh, yeah. I was just going to mention that, that Microsoft Japan study where productivity shot up by like 40%. Yeah. Okay. You wouldn't want that. Exactly. And it's not even just about productivity. The World Economic Forum has been keeping track of these four-day work week trials, and they're seeing positive results for both organizations and employees. Mm -hmm. It seems like giving employees that extra day back can seriously reduce stress and improve their overall well-being, leading to happier and more engaged employees. Yeah, it makes sense. When you have more time to recharge and take care of things outside of work, you come back feeling way more focused and energized. Win-win for everyone. Totally. And the article also highlights other examples of structural changes that can make a big difference, like Best Buy's results-only work environment, or ROW, as they call it. Basically, they give employees way more control over when, where, and how they work, uh, as long as they get their stuff done. That's amazing. Yeah. It's all about trusting employees to manage their time and get the work done. I feel like that kind of flexibility would be a huge stress reliever. And the research actually backs that up. Studies have shown that ROWE can lead to less work-life conflict and even better health behaviors. Another cool example is Slack's Focus Fridays, where they dedicate Fridays to uninterrupted work. Oh, interesting. It gives them time for deep work and less distractions which can lead to more productivity and less stress. So it seems like a key theme here is giving employees more flexibility and control over their schedules. But I'm guessing it's not as easy as just saying, okay, everyone go work whenever you want. Right. No, you're right. The article makes this really important point. When making these kind of systemic changes, you need to have clear goals. And you need ways to measure if it's working. You can't just throw stuff at the wall and hope it sticks, you need a way to track the impact of these changes and show their value. Right. It's about being strategic and intentional. You need a plan and a way to see if you're making progress. Exactly. And that's where a lot of companies struggle. The article points out that less than 40% of organizations actually quantify the financial impact of poor well-being. So it's hard to make the case to invest in these changes if you can't show how much it matters. That's a great point. We need to be able to prove that investing in employee well-being isn't just the right thing to do, but it's good for business. Exactly. Data is super important here. Having those numbers allows you to track your progress, show the value to the people in charge, and make sure the resources are being used effectively. It sounds like this is where things can get a little tricky, though. Like, how do you actually measure something like well-being? Yeah. It's not like counting widgets on a factory line. It is definitely complex. There are a lot of different ways to do it from surveys and assessments to tracking things like absenteeism and turnover. But the key is to choose metrics that actually matter for your organization and fit with your specific goals. Right. So you have to figure out what success looks like for your company and then choose the ways to measure that. We'll show you if you're getting there. Exactly. And the article really emphasizes that this is a continuous thing. You need to be always looking at the data making adjustments and learning as you go. It's not a one time fix. So it's about creating a culture of continuous improvement where yeah. you're always trying to find ways to boost well-being and create a more supportive work environment. Exactly. And we can't forget about the huge role managers play. They're the ones interacting with employees every single day and have a big impact on their experience. That's so true. The article highlights just how crucial managers are to employee well-being. They actually cite this study that found that improving a manager's people skills from like the 10th to the 90th percentile can cut turnover by a crazy 60%. Wow, that's huge. It shows you just how much influence they have. Right. But the article also acknowledges the challenges managers are facing. You know, they often don't have enough training in mental health. They're scared of saying the wrong thing. And they might even feel like these conversations don't fit with the company culture. Yeah, it's tough. We need to make sure managers have the tools and support they need yeah. to deal with these issues. Otherwise, we're setting them up for failure. Absolutely. The article gives an example of Entain, which is a 
global entertainment company. They decided to put mental health training right into their management curriculum, and they saw really high engagement. And a good chunk of managers actually took positive actions to support their employees after the training. That's great. So it shows that investing in training for managers can make a difference. It's encouraging. It seems like companies are realizing that supporting managers is key to making a better work environment. But it's not just about individual companies, right? There's a bigger picture here, too. You're absolutely right. The article talks about how important global standards are becoming and things like ESG frameworks which is environmental, social, and governance. Basically, employee well-being is now seen as a major part of managing risk, and companies are being held accountable for addressing it. It's like we're finally starting to see the shift mm. from well-being being a nice-to-have to a core part of doing business. Exactly. And this shift is happening because of a bunch of things, like new laws, investor pressure, and a growing awareness of the link between well-being and how well a business does. Right. The article mentions the Workforce Investment Disclosure Act of 2021 in the U.S. It requires public companies to show their human capital metrics. It's a pretty big deal because it means they can't just ignore these issues anymore. Right. And that's just one example of how regulations are catching up. Investors are paying attention, too. They're seeing that companies that focus on well-being tend to do better financially. So it's not just the right thing to do. It's smart business. Exactly. And that's a powerful message. It's not a question of if companies should prioritize well-being anymore. It's how. So it's great to see these big changes happening. But our listener might be wondering, like, what can they do in their own workplace? Especially if they can't, you know, make those company-wide changes. Yeah. For... Where do they even start? Well, I think it's important to remember change can start anywhere. You don't have to be the CEO to make a difference. So what can our listener do? Like, what are some actual steps they can take? Well, they can start by talking to people, have those conversations with colleagues, bring it up with their manager, advocate for a more, you know, holistic approach. I like that. It's like planting seeds, mm. right? Raising awareness. Yeah. Shifting the conversation from what's wrong with me uh -huh. to what's wrong with the system. Exactly. Even small changes can have a ripple effect. If you're a manager, you can focus on creating a more supportive environment for your team. Advocate for flexible work, set realistic goals and expectations, provide opportunities for growth. And if you're not a manager, you can still be an advocate for change. You could speak up when you see things that aren't working. Support colleagues who are struggling. And push for policies that promote well-being. The article even mentions creating well-being champion networks, which are groups of employees who are like advocates for mental health and offer peer support. Oh, that's a cool idea. It's like a grassroots well-being movement. It shows you don't need a fancy title to make a difference. Exactly. It's about creating that culture where people feel safe talking about these issues, supporting each other and working together to make a better work environment. So to wrap up this whole deep dive, what's yeah. the big takeaway for our listener? I think the biggest thing is well-being isn't just about fixing people. It's about making a healthier system. It's moving from that I frame to the S frame mm -hmm. and tackling the root causes in the work environment itself. And that takes a change in mindset, right? It's about ditching those quick fixes and Band-Aid solutions and focusing on building a work environment where people can really thrive. Absolutely. It's investing in those systemic changes that support well-being and recognizing that a healthy and engaged workforce is good for everyone, the employees, the managers, the business, the whole shebang. So if you're feeling overwhelmed or just not happy with how well-being is handled at work, you're not alone. There's a movement happening and you can be part of it. This deep dive hopefully gave you some ideas and tools to start making things better, both for yourself and the people around you. Remember, change is possible. And it usually starts with someone speaking up and saying, hey, we can do better. And if you need expert help to navigate all this and create a truly awesome workplace, reach out to The Strengths Company. We bring well-being and employee experience design together to help companies address those things that impact employee well-being. We focus on structure, people processes, everything employees deal with, so we can build workplaces where people actually thrive. Yeah, it's about creating an environment that supports people, not one that burns them out. So as you head back to work, we'll leave you with this question. What's one change, no matter how small, that you would make in your workplace to improve well-being? Not just for you, but for everyone around you. Keep learning, keep asking questions, and keep pushing for a better way to work. Until next time.